So, so how many of you guys were here last week? Okay, so you're, you're pretty excited already. I mean, you got to see all the incredible things um, that are being laid out in front of Grace Chapel and all the exciting, amazing things that we're getting to be able to be a part of. And um, all week we've been hearing just amazing reports of just people being like excited and supportive and behind. And, and, and this is part of that. You know, what we're about ready to talk about this morning might be one of the most important decisions for 2019. And there might be a lot of things that we're a part of. There might be a lot of things that we do, but there's one thing that we really need to focus on, and that is building deeper relationships with one another. We've got to do that in 2019. We've got to make a New Year's resolution, a resolution for relationship. And so that's what I'm gonna be talking to you all about this morning. And I'm about ready to draw a target on the board. And I know I'm in Tennessee, so, if anybody's packing, this is not an invitation. <laughs> okay, security team, please. All right. So, here's a little target. That's my best target. That's two years of art college right there. <laughs> Nailed it. All right, so, so, you guys all talked about your New Year's resolutions, didn't you? Right, when I said, hey, turn around and talk about your news, you actually did the thing, right, that I asked you to do. So, um, so what, is, what is your New Year's resolution? Give me some examples maybe of resolutions from the past or things that you know, popped out while we were talking. What was it? Lose some, Lose some weight, amen. I got about 10 pounds. I would love to see you gone. What else? Join a gym. Join a gym. Same thing, kind of except you won't lose any weight just from joining, right? <laughs> it's a little lesson in vision for you right there. So I should put that one a little further out, actually. I'll put that out here. Okay, what else? What? Read more. All right, what else? Eat better. Eat better, again, guys. This is why we're all so fat. <laughs> no, it's eat less, right? What? Read the word. So yeah, 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 get in the word. What? Hmm? Get involved. <laughs> Let's get a little closer. <laughs> Listen to your wife. That's right. Amen. Forgetting what's behind and pressing on. Okay, intentional with time. Listen to God's for God's voice. Yeah. Pray for wisdom. I need an amen on the back of that one. No, I mean from Don. There it is. <laughs> now, I have to warn you a little bit. I'm going to be a little bit more like a coach today than a pastor. So as we're going, I'm just going to show you a few plays, all right? And they're simple. Have you ever heard of the story of Vince Lombardi at halftime? It was during a very important game. This is a, um, a world-renowned coach of a football team. And he came in, and he got everybody huddled around, and he held up a football, and he said, guys, this is a football his halftime half speech was just explaining to them that that's a football, and all we have to do is fight for just a few inches in front of our face. That's it. Everybody do your job. Push forward and do this one thing. And that's what we're talking about. What is that kind of one thing? And I love that Jesus simplifies things down. I love that people asked him good questions. I wish people asked him more questions in the New Testament that he would have answered. But they, when they did ask a good question, we get a really good answer. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 28. It's Mark 12. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, he asked him, 
Which is the first commandment of all? That's like saying, what's the most important thing? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it. It's this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth, for there is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart and with all understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. This answer was so good, it scared off any further questions. So this is like, grab your Bible if you have it in your hands and then take about three-fourths of it. And Jesus is saying, let me just sum this up for you. Let me boil it down. Let me make this simple. Let me tell you the play. Let me tell you what you're supposed to focus on. Let me give you your New Year's resolution. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And the second one is like it. That's like an equal sign. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love people. Now I'm gonna take a risk and say, nobody said that <laughs> when we stood up and we talked about New Year's resolutions. We don't resolve to do this. We don't resolve to do this because we have a lot of things we're trying to do that get us closer and closer and closer. There are things that might kind of rearrange our lives. We have a lot of different priorities in our lives. And vision, I'm trying to give vision here, is the center of the target, the very center of the target is love God and love other people. That's the whole point. That's the whole Old Testament summarized in a few words and saying this is the main focus. You know, my boys and I, we went and did this class. It was an archery class. Um, and we drove for about 45 minutes to get to this place. I don't even remember where we were. <laughs> but we got to this place, and we had a coupon, and we all went in, and we, when we did archery. And I had never really shot a bow before. And this was a couple years ago. And I lined up for um, my first shot, and of course, I didn't even hit the, hit the target at all, and it wasn't very far away. And I'm, and I'm shooting, and I'm shooting, and I'm just missing by a mile. I'm not even, it's not even sticking in the target. And so I, I aimed a little harder, and I, miss, I kept missing worse. So the more I tried to aim, the more I missed. And finally, the, the person that was teaching the class came over, and he said, stop aiming. And I was like, that's terrible advice. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm paying you for this class. No, no, he really, he said, stop aiming. Only look at the center of the target. Just look at the center of the target and then everything else will take care of itself. And that sounded a little, I mean, it, it sounded mystical to me. Like, like when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom and all the other things will take care of themselves, right? And so I lined up and I, I stopped aiming and I just looked at the center target and all of a sudden, those arrows started going in the same spot and all, my body kind of moved around and then I started hitting the target, hitting the target right in the middle of the target without aiming. When I started focusing on what I was supposed to focus on, instead of all these other good things, right, all these other wonderful things, like especially listening to your wife, but like these... <laughs> You know, less good, eat better. But as you're, as you're aiming for the center of the target, you're trying to do these different things in your life and get things, priorities straightened out. You know, there's no amount of technology that will tell you what to point your life at. It won't organize your life ever enough to put the right thing in the center of the target. And Jesus tells us that from the very beginning. So I'm, I'm starting with the answer, okay? And so I'm basically what I'm saying is this is the touchdown, okay? This is a football. This is the thing that we're supposed to be focusing on. This is the way that we win. This is how we take over the world. 
This is how our hearts are transformed. This is how we live the life that makes all these other things come in line. It starts there. And so, love God, love other people. But God is speaking about this. You know, you notice at the very beginning of that, the first thing he said, the Lord our God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love one another, right? So what is that talking about? That's the Trinity. So there is no perfect way to draw the Trinity that's not wrong. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> so I'll put God in the middle, right? So the, this is God. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity. But what's unique about this is he's, he's describing something that they knew what this meant. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the Lord our God is one. Well, we know that what the relationship of the Father to the Son and the Spirit is. This is a community. This is God being one, but also in perfect relationship with himself. We know this because the Father is always blessing the Son and vice versa. The Father says, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus says, I don't do anything unless I see the Father doing it. Right? And, or the, the son says, the spirit's gonna come and it'll be better for the spirit to be here than for me to stay. And what's the spirit do? It guides us towards Christ. Over and over again, you see this, this shy, powerful, perfect community of God that is pointing to one another and lifting one another up God is actually in a life group. God is a life group. He is life, right? And when it says that Jesus is the light, Jesus is the life, this is the life. This is what God is actually inviting us into. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. That is a word to the Trinity. Enter into relationship with us. Enter into relationship with each other. Love us, love one another. And so all of creation, you know, in the beginning was the word, right? And the word was with God, that's Jesus. There at the beginning. Or in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You see all these pieces all coming together and you look at God as a trinity and you think of it as a concept but you rarely think of it as a community, that God is a perfect community. So I wanna I want read to you this quote from Dallas Willard, which I just love. The aim of God in history is the creation of an all-inclusive community of loving persons, with himself included in that community as its prime sustainer and most glorious Inhabitant. I'll read that again. The aim of God in history is the creation of an all inclusive community of loving persons, with Himself included in that community as its prime sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. God is not in a gated community. The doors are open wide. When Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is near. He said, the door is open. When he says, ask, seek, knock, he's saying, come on in to relationship. And then, and then you have God created the stars and he created the, the worlds and he created the land and the sea and all the fish and all the animals and all the insects. And you just, this amazing story from Genesis chapter one, walking you through creation to creation. And at the end of each thing being created, it says, and it was good and it was good and it was good. And then it gets to, to man and it, it was very good. And then there's only one thing in all of the universe that's wrong. And what is that? What's that one thing? Genesis chapter two, starting in verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. The only thing not good in the universe is man alone. And that should just jump off the page. It should, it, especially when you read Genesis 1, 2, 3, and, you, and you're walking through this, you're gonna see this image appear of God saying, creating these amazing things and saying, it's beautiful, it's good, it's beautiful, it's good, it's beautiful, it's good. And then it's not good. It should drop you in, in your tracks and say, wait, what's not good? Did you know the first crisis in human history is not sin? The first crisis in human history is man being alone. Because remember, he has perfect relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He walks with God in the garden. He has perfect relationship, he has a perfect job, he's perfectly suited for it. He is surrounded by everything that's rolling along perfectly. All his priorities are perfect and still something's missing. Something's broken, something's lost in paradise. And what's lost is relationship with one another. And God sees it and he says, I'm going to make a woman. This is my best haircut, there. <laughs> At home I practice this on a whiteboard for my wife and my my last one I drew kind of looked like a stormtrooper. So <laughs> I kind of improved on the pigtails there. So, so God, so what we're talking about is not man himself. There's nothing wrong with him necessarily in and of himself. There's nothing wrong with woman in and of herself, but there would be if they were alone. So what we're talking about is relationship. It's this part in between. It's this, you see that? This is what we're talking about. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in perfect relationship and community. God's in the life group. And then he invites Adam into that group and it's not good unless Adam can bring somebody along with him too. <laughs> right? We don't want Adam to go to this group alone. He gets to come with somebody. And you know, a lot of times we apply this to marriage and it does apply to marriage. You can definitely see a lot of things that we learn from marriage. But this is more than that. Because in his image, he created them, male and female, he created them. In his image, he created them. That's why it lays out, it says it twice. God is saying, there's something really important here, draw a big circle around this, relationship to me and relationship to one another matters. You know, sin itself is an archery term, the word sin in, in the Bible. So when you think about missing the mark, when you think about like, all right, I'm trying to do a lot of things, I'm shooting a lot of arrows at my life and I'm trying to hit the target, but I'm aiming for all these things, you're, not, you're gonna miss, everybody misses, right? But you're aiming at the wrong target, you're just gonna keep missing in the wrong place. You're like, man, you know what, no matter how skinny you are, that's not gonna make you love people, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, you can read the word of God and not be loving God or people, did you know that you can really get involved in church stuff and never love people? Did you know you could join a life group and not build relationships? The life group's not the point. That's not the target. That's just where some people are, right? The point is going into it to love somebody, to put yourself vulnerably in a position to be loved, right? And so what we're talking about here is that God is a perfect community. The first crisis in the history of the world is it's not good to be alone. And this isn't up on the screen, but Proverbs 18, verse one says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire or seeks his own destruction. He rages against all wise judgment. When we put ourselves on our own, and this is probably out of um, all the stuff, this is confession time, out of all of these, this is the part 
that I struggle with the most because when I run into a problem, I do this thing where I have kind of like try, a try harder problem. I have a try harder problem. I think that's the best way I can describe it, which is just like, all right, I'm gonna double down and make this work by myself. And I have to make myself move towards relationship when I have a problem. So if I'm, if I'm struggling with something and I'm going, and I walk over to Jonathan's office and I say, Jonathan, I'm having a hard time. He's like, what's wrong? <laughs> because it's so hard for me to do that. Anybody else kind of struggle with that? You're kind of like, well, all right, I'm struggling with something. I need to just try harder. I need to just make this work. I need to, I need to double down. And, and, and I go to, into it and I to try harder. And then what ends up happening is I begin to fall apart because why? I was created for relationship. I'm not supposed to figure out how to do this on my own. I'm not supposed to. I need other people. We all need other people. This idea that all you need is God is wrong. You and God alone on your own and that's all that you need is wrong. God is saying you need the church. You need community. You were created with the need. You need people that love you, that encourage you, that challenge you, that tell you you're wrong. And without it, you're lost. In Genesis chapter three, starting in verse one, we see a, a different problem kind of emerge, which is I'm gonna try to figure out how to do this without God. <laughs> so now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, God has indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Or has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit in the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So you have this thing, the tree in the midst of the garden that they weren't supposed to eat from, and it's got this fruit on it, that we don't know what it is, it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I always was hung up on that. Like, why isn't there a good tree and a bad tree? And if you eat from the bad tree, then you're in trouble, <laughs> right? But if you eat from the tr good tree, you're fine. No, it's the knowledge of good and evil. It's like the good bad tree, right? <laughs> and I know there's a lot to this, right? So we could, we could really study this for a long time. But the knowledge of good and evil is at least, right? Is at least, I'm gonna make life work on my own terms. I'm gonna do this without God. I'm gonna do this my way. I'm gonna figure this out. How can I make life work without God? How can I make life work by rearranging some things and knowing some things and figuring things out? Anybody really, really stew and stew and stew and try to figure your life out by trying different things, like by experimenting and, 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 and thinking about and thinking about and thinking about and trying new things? Anybody kind of do one of that? You're not, like, when I'm struggling, I don't go, oh, you know, some people go, I'm gonna try harder. And some people, what they do is they go, I need a new plan. <laughs> and then when I go back at this same problem, it's gonna get figured out. But they don't think, I need a new plan and it includes relationship. I'm not gonna find it by myself. They don't think, if I don't go to God and say, I don't know, then I'm gonna be lost. And that's what's going on here is life on my own terms is this tree of the knowledge of good and evil where you can wander off and get lost. Because everybody has a system to make life work without God. Your New Year's resolution is a glimpse into what you think will make your life work. It's a little picture into what it is that you think if you could really get that dialed in, then life would really come together and it would really work and it might be a great thing, 
but it's not God. And it's not other people. So what really keeps us from making a relationship resolution? What really holds us back? Because I hear a lot of different answers to that. When, when I'm talking with people, people call me and they're trying to get in a small group and they're like, I need to get in a small group. It needs to have people that will never bother me in it. <laughs> I need to have childcare. And, I've, and, I, and, and, and I also have to, you know, um, it has to be exactly the same age as me and socioeconomic status. I need to be in a group where the, the people are little tiny clones of me, <laughs> right? And they'll just say exactly what I think. And, and nobody really says that, I'm joking, but that's kind of what it feels like sometimes. Sometimes I feel like I'm in charge of a dating service, people. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> it's like people are like, well, you know, she's kind of cute, but I don't like her. You know, it's like... <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? I mean, look to your neighbor and tell him, you're, you're my brother or you're my sister in Christ. Go ahead, tell him. <laughs> These are your brothers and sisters. You get to pick your friends, people, but you do not get to pick your family. This is your family, whether you like it or not. You know, you don't go to Thanksgiving and go, I'm sorry, you're not on the list, right? It's like, well, you know, Uncle Bob's here. We have to put up with him for Thanksgiving, right? It's like, because that's what, that's what family is. That's who we are in, in, in God's kingdom. We're the family of God. <clears throat> oh, I just want to go on and on about that, but I'm not going to. <laughs> but what really keeps people back um, from relationship is these three things. And, and I want to share this with you because I want you to see it in the text of Genesis chapter two, starting in verse eight. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman you gave me. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's just really funny. All right, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And so you, you see like right off the bat, this picture of really the real reasons why we don't wanna move into community. The reason why you don't sign up to be in a life group, the reason why you don't wanna lead a life group, it's fear. The first thing that Adam says is, I was afraid. There was no fear before this. Think about what that's gonna be like in heaven, no fear. But after sin, there's fear. And for good reason, because their own children are killing each other a couple stories later, right? Relationships are dangerous. Let me tell you why you might, want not, might, might not wanna be in a relationship in a small group. Because it's dangerous. You can get hurt in there. People could get to know you and hurt you. We're not safe. We're all flawed. We're all broken. That's the real reason why it's difficult to get connected in relationship. But God is healing us and drawing us together anyways. And that healing is right where it's at. The second thing that happens is shame. The great thing about getting connected into a life group is you're gonna be known but the worst thing about getting involved in a life group is that you're gonna be known. People are gonna know you. They're going to see right through you. We all think we have these great masks, but we don't. It all gets exposed in relationship. We see one another for who we really are, and we see our little warts and flaws and struggles, and that's, that's shame that fear, and then the really ugly one, blame. 
starts to creep in. You might have some really good reasons why you don't wanna be in relationship with other believers. Like legitimate reasons. Kind of like, well, the woman gave me the fruit and I ate it, <laughs> right? What's the first thing? The first act of sinful man is blame. I'm afraid, I'm ashamed, and now I blame. And blame is where really where resentment, where bitterness, where unforgiveness, it's where all of that lives. You know, shame is that thing that kind of keeps us thinking, well, there's something so wrong with me that's not like anyone else. I hear people say this all the time, I've never told anyone this, and then they unload this horrible thing that has happened to them, and I'm like, yeah, that's happened to me too. And they're blown away. They did not know that terrible things happened to everyone. I've had people share, I've gotten pastors together in rooms where somebody would share something and they'd say, I had no idea you were struggling with that. And they all were struggling with exactly the same thing. Like, we're not alone. We're all struggling with a lot of the same kinds of things, but boy, shame can keep us back thinking, well, I'm the only one, I'm so flawed, I'm unworthy, and it keeps us from really wanting to be in this deeper community with God and with each other. So fear, shame, blame, those are the real reasons why we don't want to be in a group. So you think about, just in review, these three things, trying to live life on your own. Life on your own terms. I'm gonna figure this out on my own. Or actually being guided by fear. How many good decisions have you made guided by fear? Look in scripture at all the instances, and there's a lot, of the times where people were guided by fear instead of by the Lord. And look what happens, what's the fruit? Or being guided by shame. Shame starts to become in charge and rule you. Or being guided by blame. A lot of times we don't feel like blame is really in charge of us because we think, well, that's just something that someone else did and we're pointing the finger. But the reality is, is that that unforgiveness is just as much controlling you as any other chain of shame, any other chain of fear, that that blame, that bitterness has is, is got you tied down to the floor just as tight. So what does God do? And it's this really interesting thing. Genesis chapter two, verse 22. The Trinity calls a huddle. Listen to this. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. You see that? There's the Trinity talking in a huddle. What are we gonna do? The first time I read this, I thought, I never noticed that there was another tree in the Garden of Eden. I've heard a lot about the one with the fruit on it, but here's this other tree. So the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden till, to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So what's going on here? It's like this tree of life. I'm gonna draw this over here. And the problem is that if after you know the difference between good and evil, if he goes over and he eats from the tree of life, he's going to be stuck like this forever. And so God, in his graciousness, in his kindness, gets him out of the garden so he can do what? Send Jesus to go find us and bring us back home. Jesus didn't come into the world. Now, now, hear me out on this. Jesus didn't come into the world for sin. Jesus conquered sin, but he didn't come into the world for sin. He came into the world for you. To grab hold of your hand and pull you back into community, into deep relationship. He wants you to love God and love other people. And he's trying to get you to the tree of life. He is trying to bring you back home. And everything inside of us, every sinful part of us is pushing away from wanting to be in relationship with each other and pushing us away from wanting that deeper relationship with God. And it rules us and we're slaves unless God comes and gets us and sets us free, we're gonna be lost and alone. 
Jesus is the way back to life. Well, the truth is, is that relationships are hard and people are messy. Jesus is a life group, right? He's, he, he, he's in one, right? God is a life group. God led a life group as well. Jesus had a group. He had a small group. If I was doing small group Sunday like this today, he would come up here and he would have a group. And with about 12 people in it, he would be going around and he would, he would pick out a few of you. And they would, if he picked you out for his group, it would not be because you're so great. His group was a mess, right? God didn't pick people for his small group that had it all together and had no mess, right? We're talking zealots. This is a guy that sneaks around with a knife and stabs people when they're not looking, right? We're talking about fishermen, stinking. You know, think about how much fish stinks. Now think about no showers, right? And now think about these men that were just probably just like, these are like brutes, man. These guys were strong and they were rough. I bet their talk around the campfire was not clean, Okay, we're talking about a messy group of people. God called regular messed up people into his group. I'll never forget this. Um, it, it really changed how I thought about church. I was trying to put a marriage ministry together and we had this call for marriage mentors. And so I put up a slide on Sunday morning. Um, yeah, they used to be actual slides, right? And the slide said, I'm looking for screwed up couples to point other screwed up couples to Jesus. <laughs> and somehow I got it in there, you know, snuck it in. And, and, and I got 52 couples that signed up because they were like, well, I'm a screwed up couple. I can point people to Jesus, <laughs> right? <laughs> and these are people committing to say, yeah, I'll take, have someone over to my house that's having a hard time in their marriage and I'll meet with them for six weeks and talk to him about Jesus, no problem. So 52, then second service, somebody thought that doesn't sound very good, screwed up people, you know, it's like, let's, let's clean this up a little bit. So they changed it to, um, we're looking for couples to point other couples to Jesus. Guess how many people signed up in second service? Zero, I'll never forget it. So what, are we, what am I talking about? I'm talking about God uses regular people to do extraordinary things. And that's the whole point. God, we're not looking for people to have it all together. We're not looking for people that know everything. We're looking for people who are willing to open up their lives and their homes and say, hey, come on, let's go figure out how to follow Jesus together. Because I'll tell you what happens in community when you really start to pursue God, when you really start to pursue relationship, when you make a relationship resolution for your life, fear starts to become courage. Shame starts to become healing and transformation. Blame becomes ownership, responsibility, dominion transformation. You think about these things. When you really pursue relationship, when you dig in and really go for it with relationship, yeah, you're going to get hurt. Yes, you're going to be disappointed. Yes, it's going to be frustrating. I don't want a bunch of people to get together and have little therapy groups. I want people to get together and do life with each other. I want people that get connected in relationship and start taking on the world together. God has asked us to get together, not for for inner reasons only. God has asked us to get together so that we can change the world together, so we can be an army, so that we can truly link up arms and make a difference. So I want you to reach out in front of you and grab that green card that's in the seat back in front of you. I just want you to look at it. I know you might not fill it out, it's fine, but at least just want you to hold it. <laughs> so I can say, I gave you an opportunity to get connected today, okay? Okay. Um, so wave them in the air so I, I know you found it. So they're out there. Look at that. Look around. It's exciting. So 
Lots of connection opportunity out there. So your name, your email, your phone number, that's all you have to put on there. We're gonna watch a few testimonial videos of people whose lives have been changed by being in community. And then I'm gonna call forward a bunch of life group uh, leaders who have either open groups with, with room in their group for a few or brand new groups that are just now starting. And I'm gonna line them up out here right in front and they're just gonna go like this. And you guys, all you have to do is bring that card and hand it to those people. And um, so let's watch those videos and then and give you a minute to kind of fill those out and then I'll bring up the leaders and we'll do that together. I'm Deanna Dolan and Life Groups impacted me in a huge way because when I first started going to one, I wasn't a believer. Um, I came from a religion that didn't worship Jesus. And um, I actually came to a life group to secretly learn more about him and also argue with Christians, and I just was blown away because I was treated like family, and um, they answered all my questions. Like, I was asking crazy questions to try to disprove the Bible, like, oh, does it talk about dinosaurs? You know, whatever I could think of, and, and they were just calm and gracious with me and would answer my questions and would not make me feel stupid you know, for asking them. But then I remember something that really stuck out to me is when they invited us over for Christmas. And I remember sitting there at the table and they're all praying before the meal. And then we go to open presents and they got me as many presents, if not more than they got their own kids. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, I've never experienced love like this. And so it was actually in my life group that I came one evening and said, how do you know if you're a Christian? And I prayed the prayer with the life group leader. And uh, so yeah, I would say that life groups changed my life forever. So. My name is Nate Dixon and um, I host a life group for men between the ages of 18 and 30. And you know, at, at one time or another, um, every young man is dealing with some form of fear, shame, um, condemnation, um, just from the enemy um, and from experiences in their lives. And one of the most powerful things to me um, has just been after those guys have initially taken um, that step of faith and getting into a life group, because it's hard. It's hard to take that initial step, you know, just in, in getting into a life group. But after they've taken that first step, and just started doing life with each other, I've seen their lives be totally transformed. Just looking around the room on any given Tuesday night, um, just seeing people begin empathizing with one another and then starting having coffee with each other and sharing meals you know, throughout the week. And they start walking in the trenches with one another. And as a consequence of that, I've seen them truly embrace like Christ's mission. And that just being that he didn't come to be served, but he came to serve. And if there's one thing I've seen from men who have attended my life group is they've learned what it means to serve, which means they're not in bondage anymore, which means they've been set free to then walk how Jesus walked and to start living you know, how Jesus has lived. And I've seen that played out in every single young man's life in our small group to a great degree. And it's been so encouraging. It means that Jesus is alive. I come to Grace Chapel here, uh, never going to church, never knew anything about church, had no intention of going to church. I come to watch my grandson and daughter be baptized. I sat on the front row and cried like a baby. I loved every minute of it. I told my wife that day when we left, I said, this is home. This is where I need to be. And we've been here at Grace ever since. I hooked up with my small group here at Grace, and they, uh, they have put so much into my life. They've led me down roads that I never thought I could have been led down. It's just everything's new for me. I'm learning so much. I had no knowledge of the Bible. I mean, it's just totally changed my life. It's changed my marriage. It's changed everything about my whole life. So that's pretty well where I'm at today. Been here soon, be here four years, and I wouldn't change a thing. Amen. Go ahead, life group leaders, come on up. So come on up here, life group leaders. I know you're gonna have to push through. 
They're like, can you, these people are saying, hey, I'm gonna make room in my life, and they have made this commitment. Can we just thank them and give them a hand for taking that risk? That's scary. So Ian, why don't you come up here? Anybody excited that we're planting a church in Fairview? Right? I am so excited. Um, I was telling Ian, I'm like, this is like one of the things I'm, the, I'm, re, I'm like the most excited about. Um, and, and the fact that we're planting a church in Fairview and, and Ian is going to lead that charge, I wanted him just to get a, a moment just, to, just to, to talk to you guys about what they're up to. Yeah, so super exciting stuff. I have to comment. I mean, if anybody's not impressed with what Jimmy just did on this whiteboard, I, I did a training <laughs> last night, and, and I had a whiteboard out, and somebody said that it looked like hieroglyphics when I was done. So I'm just, I'm wildly impressed with your artistic ability. But, um, but I just wanted to take a second, we did, and, and say um, that, that we're excited about what's going on in Fairview. There is some amazing stuff happening out there. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So our team's all pumped up about it. But as we've talked about, what are the different strategies and how can we, how do we, how do we gear up to plant a church out there this fall? Um, the, the unchanging 100% pathway is this. We've said, man, in order to have a thriving church this fall, we've gotta create a thriving community right now. And so we have over 10 different life groups that are ready to get up, get started uh, out in Fairview. We're training, we're preparing, and we're ready to launch those this next month because we believe in order to have a thriving com church, we've got to launch from a thriving community. And that happens when we start doing life together, like Pastor Jimmy just said, and we're ready to do that right now. So if you wanna hear more about Grace Chapel Fairview and the life groups that we got going on for that, come find somebody with one of these lanyards on that says Fairview on it, and we'll connect, we'll hang out, talk, and keep you in the loop about what's happening in Fairview this year. All right, thanks, Ian. All right, I'm gonna pray for all these leaders and then um, we're gonna turn on some music. We're gonna give you guys some time. Um, it's okay if your kids are in childcare for a few minutes, come up, meet some different leaders um, and go ahead and give them your card so they can follow up with you this week and get connected right in. Isn't this exciting? Look at this. <laughs> I love it. So, F Father, we lift up these leaders to you and we ask God, uh, for you to use them as a, a light, as an encouragement, as your grace in this community, Lord. God, I thank you that even if there were no buildings, your church would keep meeting, your kingdom would still come, and God, I thank you that your church meets all throughout the week, all over the place, in Williamson County, and all around, God. We lift up these leaders to you. We ask that you would set them apart, that you would give them what they need to love and encourage the people that get connected into their group. And God, I do pray that you would move on people's hearts to respond and get connected this morning. God, we all have to make a resolution to go deeper in a relationship with you and with each other. So we lift all these things up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You have a great week. <laughs>